Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Following on from my previous two videos where I examined the naval tactical combat system and the land combat system for Remember the Main, I'm now going to look at the overarching strategic game and this is the this is the structure that links the two elements I showed you previously together and gives it its sort of narrative flow, if that makes any sense. So while the the tactical games are great if you're very short on time and just want a quick and easy scenario to play, they're wonderful. But the the real meat, the real strategic enjoyment of Remember the Main and the, the challenges that it presents to the US and the Spanish players are really to be found in this. So what I'm proposing to do is just to have a look at how a single turn in the strategic game works and just talk through the various steps. I'll also say a word or two about setup and um, the strategic choices that both players have. So to begin with, a quick look at what's going on here. Um, as you can see, the... Um, the tactical land maps are devoid of troops. There is nobody on them, or so it would seem. And there's a very good reason for that in game terms, because at the beginning, the US forces are still mustering. So the scenario begins with the declaration of war in April, and um, April 1898, that is. And the thinking behind keeping these maps empty is actually quite clever. A, it saves a bit of setup time. The players can just get straight into the, the strategy behind organizing their naval forces, really, in the first part of the game. And the troops for both sides are actually held off map. If I just shunt the camera over a little bit, you can see this holding an organization box here. Um, so the Spanish troops, of course, are in orange, US troops in blue, Cuban rebels in green. And so the way that the tactical maps are brought into play is when the US finally gets round to invading a Spanish-held territory, the Spanish player then places his available troops for that territory on the map, and then the US player gets to try establishing his beachhead and so on and so forth. It's a very interesting wrinkle. I think this is possibly the only game I've got with this sort of detailed tactical element where nobody starts uh, placed on the maps. I like it. I think it's uh, it's quite a clever system. And as I say, it lets you get into the, the action of the game without laborious setup. Um, I mean, of course, you do get the laborious setup later, but your placement is often fairly obvious. So, uh, so that's how, how that works. But... As you've probably surmised, the real, real element of manoeuvre at the beginning of the game is naval. So in this game, Spanish reinforcements are really, really limited. Most of the ground combat power that they're able to bring to bear is already in place in their territories in the Caribbean. The US player actually starts this game with no troops in play at all. The, um, the army is still being organized, which of course took time. Um, staging bases had to be developed in places like Tampa and Mobile. And, um, and the, the logistical effort needed to transport a big enough force over to Cuba to make significant gains was something that could not be rushed, even though elements of it were, because of the really tight time scale of this war. So for the first few turns, certainly for the first two turns of the game, the action is purely naval, and both sides have different objectives here. For the US, they have a lot of choices. They could begin massing their fleets in preparation for escorting um, the troops across the uh, Gulf of Mexico, or they can try and seize command of the, uh, of the waters immediately surrounding Cuba. Now, that is usually a very good move for the US um, player to make, because 
on the one hand, it chokes off the Spanish bases from resupply. There are merchant ships in this game, and the Spanish player does um, score points for managing to get cargo into Cuban ports. So choking that off early is a good move for the U.S., the other advantage is it's very much in the U.S. player's interest to gain Mahanian-style command of the ocean. And the best way to do that is to try and draw the Spanish fleet into a fight. Because in terms of overall combat power, the U.S. does vastly outgun the Spanish fleet. If the Spanish oblige them by assembling all their forces and meeting the combined strength of the U.S. Navy in a pitched battle they will be doing the US player a tremendous favour. It will probably be bloody, but odds are the Spanish would end up losing. Now, a better strategy for the Spanish player is to get his ships over to the Caribbean region, but not just to restrict their movements there. Yes, they've got to try and be a thorn in the US side. They've got to be a presence disrupting US um, troop movements and tying down the US fleet in, in fruitless games of cat and mouse. But the Spanish can also gain points for demonstrating off the US coast. Now, a bombardment of a major US port would probably not do much material damage. But like so many conflicts, this war was all about uh, newspaper column inches. And the battleship Pelayo, for example, shelling New York Harbour, even if only briefly, would have sent shockwaves through the US and would have had a very disruptive effect on the war effort because not unnaturally the good citizens would have been clamouring for the Navy to be recalled from the Caribbean to, to defend the US against these you know, marauding Spaniards. So the Spaniards are not without options. They They need to be very clever in how they play this, but the inclusion of all these US ports in the game gives them plenty of targets that they can strike at. So those are the broad options that both sides have, but I'll put the strategy discussion on hold for a moment. Um, in order to get some pieces on the board, I did play a couple of turns. Um, so it's actually the beginning of turn three when my demonstration begins. Now, before the campaign phase gets underway, and, and like the naval and ground combat rules, the campaign turn is divided into several phases which have to be followed in order. So the campaign phase begins with the reinforcement segment, where both sides receive any available reinforcements. Um, that is followed by the campaign event sequence, there are a ton of random events in this game, all based on the historical occurrences that uh, had a major impact in the war. And, um, and, and they're all plausible. Some of them did happen, some of them didn't but could have. And they make every game rather different. Some of them can have a huge impact if they occur at the right time. Um, it then the, the opening campaign phase is then followed by the naval sequence, where the US player conducts all their naval movement and operations for the turn, followed by the Spanish player. And then, if applicable, it moves on to the land combat sequence, which you would have seen in my previous video. And then, finally, the turn marker phase, which is effectively a clean-up, um, begin-the-next-turn phase. But let's move through all these elements of a turn in detail. So the reinforcement segment... I'm just going to um, indicate the turn record track. So this game lasts um, all the way through from mid-April to mid-September, I suppose at the height of the hurricane season. And so that is the time limit set. The game is played till the end, unless one side or other gets a 30-point lead, in which case victory is declared for that side. It's a sudden death win. The vast majority of your points are earned by occupying territory. So Havana, the key target, is worth 30 points, but that is only scored at the end of the game. 
Um, the other lesser Spanish ports are worth a um, lower number of points. Both sides score points for sinking enemy ships, uh, for causing damage to enemy convoy routes, for bombardments. Um, the Spanish in particular earn a fair few points for successfully bombarding US ports. So there's an incentive for them to do that. And it's tricky, but not impossible for one side or the other to draw ahead by that much. But ownership of Havana is usually what does it. So, oh, and incidentally, only the US player records points. Spanish points are recorded as a negative against the score of the US player. So if the US player ended a turn with five points and the Spanish had six, the overall score would be minus one. So, to begin, it's the beginning of the third game turn, and the first thing that happens is the reinforcement segment. So I've left reinforcement counters underneath the turn counter as a reminder. Let's see who gets what. So we have a stack of US ships. A beachhead marker, which represents the logistical preparations needed to conduct an invasion. And more ships. So consulting the US Navy's reinforcement charts, I can see that the first three ships and the beachhead start at Norfolk Navy Yard. And the um, flotilla of... Um, Auxiliary Cruisers starts at New York. So I will place the reinforcement, the bulk of the reinforcements can go to Norfolk. And the Auxiliary Cruisers to New York. Now, the other thing I've got to look at is the um, land organization table. So I'll just fly us over here quickly. Now, because it is the first turn in May, the US gets two reinforcement units. They have received Ludlow's Brigade, and some Gatlings, not a huge force, and these can be placed at either Tampa Bay or Mobile, or just Tampa as I should call it. So the US choice of reinforcements, let's see if I can zoom in, see, you can see what's going on. These land units can appear either there or there. Now, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Mobile is a little bit further away, but it's a bit better defended at the start of the game, and it has a supply of coal, a large enough supply of coal to support a fleet, whereas Tampa doesn't really have that advantage, although the proximity to Cuba, as I say, is a bit better. So it's a bit of a choice. Um, I think... Given that this is only the, the beginning of the US military build-up, the US player would probably be cautious and would place these this first batch of troops in Mobile. Now, I personally wouldn't recommend the US player indulge in any amphibious invasions this turn, mainly because the forces at his command are really, really small. I mean, you might gain a foothold somewhere, but you really want a larger army than that before you <laughs> begin uh, uh, um, indulging in some overseas adventures, if I can call them that. So they are not really going to go anywhere this turn. So having done with the reinforcement phase, we now come to campaign events. And within the rule book, there is a fairly extensive list of possible campaign events. 
you roll two six-sided dice and appoint one of them to be the first digit and the other to be the second uh, to see which event you trigger. So I'm going to make a roll. My first dice roll is a 1 and the second is a 5, so that makes a 15. And that says, sorry if the print is a bit uh, fine in this, Talkative captain of a neutral ship reports passing a Spanish battle fleet, unquote. One Spanish piece in any one sea route is chosen by the US player and is revealed to him, including the exact ships in the squadron if a squadron marker is revealed. Okay. Now, in theory, in a two-player game, Ships sailing on their own would be face down and ships sailing in a group would be under a squadron marker. So were I the US player, I would not know who most of these Spaniards were. Now, in the context of this game, an action has already been fought with the Spanish-Cuban squadron at Havana, so a US player would know what ships were there. However, the US player can see that there's a Spanish squadron, the Cadiz squadron, in fact, in the mid-Atlantic, and another squadron, Admiral Severa's Cape Verde squadron, also in the mid-Atlantic region, the, um, the Cadiz boys are probably heading for the United States, or they could be fainting with the intention of then moving south. It's a bit difficult to say. So the US player, mindful of what the journalists would say if the Spanish appeared off the US coast, and also wanting to know what sort of force would be confronting his, uh, his own mid-Atlantic patrol squadron, decides that his helpful neutral captain is going to blab about what's in the Cadiz squadron. The Spanish player therefore has to reveal, or just get the right box, picking up the ships from the Spanish holding box. The Spanish player would have revealed that the Cadiz squadron comprises the battleship Pelayo, the cruiser Carlos V, and the, gosh, I need my glasses for this, Alfonso XII, another cruiser. So only three ships, but fairly formidable. And rather worryingly for the US player, they have no real idea where this force is headed. So that information has proven quite useful. We now come to the naval segment uh, and the US player goes first. Each player um, has a naval phase that's divided into first the repair segment, loading and coaling segment, naval movement segment, search segment and naval combat segment. So in the repair segment, they have an they have the opportunity to repair damaged ships that happen to be in port. The US player always has two repair points every turn, which can be used to either fix da um, damaged boxes on their ships, which is a simple matter of erasing damage marks on these, if the ship happens to be in port. Now, the US player, neither player, in fact, can spread these repair points out. They have to designate a port and some ports, as you can see, let me do another zoom in. Have a little number and that is the limit to the repair points that you can expend in that port. So as a repair and maintenance facility, Mobile is not as well off as the more developed ports on the US Atlantic coast. The Spanish variably get one or two repair points depending on what turn it is and they are limited by the same restrictions the um, US are. Some, some of their ports are capable of greater repairs than others. 
Now, repair points in the naval segment can also be used to fix damaged coastal defences, so artillery and such like. And if you expend your points repairing coastal defences, the value of your points are doubled, uh, reflecting the relative ease by which uh, gun batteries and entrenchments could be put back into operation. So this turn, the only side that has a damaged ship, at least damaged in combat, is the US player. And that was the unlucky cruiser New York that uh, got nicked during one of the early battles outside Havana. Now, that ship is on blockade duty, um, or at least it was. Um, but it's either... No, that's right. It's at sea with the rest of the US fleet. So the New York is not going to get repaired this turn. Um, no other US unit has suffered damage, so those two repair points are unused. So next comes the loading and recoaling segment. Now, looking back at the ports. You recall I mentioned the um, little triangle that denotes that it's a coaling port. If you have ships in a friendly port, either your own or neutral ports that are friendly to you, you can recoal there during this segment. And also transport ships can embark troops, um, Merchant ships, if you so require them to, can load cargo. Colliers can load coal. Essentially, any ship that needs to pick something up can do so. So, looking at the state of the US fleets, and I'm going to bring the uh, sheet back up now. The very powerful US 2nd um, North Atlantic Squadron has used about half its coal. They have a collier in attendance, which is fully loaded. But the general feeling is that they still have enough coal to keep them going. They're making a slow meander around Cuba on their way to Santiago. At least I think, yes, that is Santiago down there. So they're all right for coal for the moment. The Northern Patrol Squadron, which is currently cruising off Bermuda is also a bit low on coal, but they've reached their patrol area, so they don't really need to worry about returning to port this turn. And lastly, the US Flying Squadron, which just so happens to be in the same square, or at least area, the Bahama Channel, as the second North Atlantic Squadron, they have actually burnt all their coal so it is time for them to get their collier to um, start coaling. Now, if you're not in harbour, but you have a collier accompanying your squadron, you can recoal at sea, but it has to be in a space that is adjacent to land. So effectively, what you do is you find a quiet cove to put into. Or at least you do it ship by ship or in small batches, how, wh whatever the local circumstances permit. That level of granularity isn't really covered. So what happens in practice when you do that? Is that in this case, I would mark the collier as being completely emptied. In this game, colliers do not... Um, transfer their loads gradually, they completely empty themselves and replenish the squadron that they're accompanying. So the colliers with the flying squadron are now empty. Next turn the US player, or next opportunity, the US player will probably want to detach them and send them home to pick up more coal. But the flying squadron is once more fully coaled. And that's all the US Navy needs to worry about for refueling this turn. Um, nobody is going to do any loading. As I said earlier, the US doesn't have enough soldiers to really embark on any crazy adventures this turn, so they're going to leave it. So now it is the naval movement segment, and they have some choices here. The... Um, the second North Atlantic squadron is going to get underway.
But before I move anyone, I'm just going to explain how movement works. The Naval Operations chart tells you how many movement points it costs to do various forms of movement. And you have to pay attention here a bit because the coal burning rules are tied in very closely with this. So, in essence, if you have a squadron with a ship that has a speed of two, two movement factors or less, then you have two movement points uh, maximum per turn and you burn one load of coal for each movement point you expend. Now you notice that some activities don't cost a movement point while entering deep sea mid-Atlantic zones are actually quite an expensive thing to do. If you have a ship or if none of your ships are speed two or less your squadron has three movement points per turn. The first move with that your faster squadron performs doesn't require you to burn coal, even if it costs a movement point. The second, if it costs a movement point, will cost you one coal point. And if you make a third move, which you're permitted to do with fast squadrons, that will cost another two coal points. So let's say, for example, that a, a slow squadron moved from one zone to another and then move to yet another zone, it would burn a total of two coal. A fast squadron making a similar movement going from one zone to another would burn no coal, the first movement. The second zone it moved into would burn one coal, and the third and the next one it entered would burn two coal. So it would burn a total of three. I hope that makes sense. It took me a while to wrap my head around that one back in the day, but it becomes a bit intuitive after a while. So keeping to their original mission, I'll come in close so you can actually see the counters a bit. The second North Atlantic squadron which is actually a really powerful agglomeration of warships. I'll show you how thick the stack is. Is going to continue its voyage towards Santiago. The question is, how fast do they want to move? Now, they do include some slow ships, so they're going to have to take it a bit easy. Now, originally, the US player was rushing them into position. They stopped off at Havana first and left some ships behind as a blockading squadron after inflicting some damage on the Cuba squadron ships there. So now they're steaming round this way. Part of their mission is to interfere with all the Spanish merchant shipping that's crowding these waters, but mainly they want to bottle up Santiago. Now... With slow ships in the squadron, they're only going to be able to move two points, but that is enough to get them to the Windward Passage this turn. And they could go straight into blockading um, Santiago if they wanted to. So they are going to go for it. So one move, two moves, and they can go straight into blockade. So those two moves cost them a movement point each. And because they're a slow squadron for movement purposes, they burn... Hang on, I fold the paper so you can see it. They will burn two of their three coal points. So I've just reduce them to one out of six there. Six, incidentally, is the maximum coal capacity. It's an, an aggregate of how much you can carry. Um, this game doesn't go to the extent of tracking every individual ship's coal, otherwise we'd be here for a really long time. So the second North Atlantic squadron has positioned itself where it wants to be. The flying squadron 
has a choice as to its mission. It can either press on round to get to the other major port, Cienfuegos, to try and nab that one, or it can try and interpose itself between, let's say, at least Hispaniola and Admiral Severa's incoming squadron. It's a tough choice for the US because they don't know the strength of the Cape Verde squadron. It may well be all of Severa's armoured cruisers. It may just be a few of them. Perhaps the best thing for them to do would be to put themselves off Puerto Rico because that's one of the major targets for the US. But it's difficult to know. After some brief consideration, they decide that the Spanish will probably come to them anyway. And as the Flying Squadron is a fast squadron, they are going to... Now, are they? They do have a full complement of coal, but it's only thanks to the fact that their collier emptied itself. So they're going to divide their force. They are going to separate their colliers out from the squadron. And while the heavy ships press on, the colliers are going to return home to pick up some coal. So the colliers are going to go one, two, three. And head back to Mobile while the flying squadron is going to go one, two, three. Now that was a bit of a rush and they've already burnt half their remaining coal and their colliers have gone, but it's worth the risk because they're very close to placing themselves off Cienfuegos before the Spanish can react. And of course, once you're on blockade, you don't burn coal at anything like the same rate. So all they need to do is get there. Now, they could give in to the temptation to blockade Manzanilla. Manzanilla. Sorry, I apologize for my pronunciation now. But while they would block in some Spanish merchant ships, arguably Cienfuegos is the greater prize. So they're going to stick to the plan. The last U.S. squadron um, is going to be the, um, let's move the camera up a bit, the Northern Patrol Squadron out in the Mid-Atlantic, by Bermuda specifically. And they've got about a third of their coal left. So the question is, what do they want to do? They're still keeping an eye out on the incoming Spanish fleet over there. They need to keep some sort of tabs on them and see what they do. But they don't want to waste too much of their coal moving either. So what they're going to do, they're going to take a bit of a risk because this will burn a fair bit of coal. They're going to move into the Sargasso Basin. They're going to place one of their detachments of auxiliary cruisers on top of their squadron counter. Now, what that represents is spreading your scouting line out to help your fleet. Now, that first move, because they're a fast squadron, doesn't make them burn any coal. But their second um, action which is going into search mode, will burn some coal. So I'm just going to mark that off their sheet. So there we go. The Northern Patrol Squadron is now down to a sixth of its coal. But it's worth it 
because they're on patrol in a fairly central position. And if the Spanish were planning on sneaking straight through to the US coast, they may find it's not as easy as they thought. Incidentally, if you're wondering, it is possible for a squadron at sea to reduce itself to zero coal. That does not mean that they're stuck drifting without any coal whatsoever, but it does mean that they have to limp very slowly and painfully back to port, an operation which will take them many, many turns indeed. Um, and if you've got slow ships with you, don't, don't even think about how much time that is going to waste. So... Essentially, unless you've got fast ships and there's a darn good reason, don't run out of coal, dear hearts. It's really not advised. So that is going to be all the US naval movement for this turn. They have some other auxiliary cruisers in port and some other ships, but as the US player, I would have preferred to form them into slightly stronger squadrons before sending them to sea. So we'll leave them where they are for now. I'd also like to conserve some of the transport and sea lift capacity against the day when they're needed to transport troops. So keeping them safe in port for now is a good idea. So that's the end of the naval movement segment. Now, had there been a Spanish ship or squadron marker in that area when the, um, the Northern Patrol Squadron began searching... I would have been able to roll on this table to see if I'd located any of them. Now, when a ship or a squadron, actually it has to be a squadron, oh no, it can be a, a, a group of auxiliary cruisers, enters, when anyone enters search mode, it lasts from turn to turn. So... Until you give that squadron a different order, they're basically on patrol and anyone that passes through is subject to a roll to being found. Now, admittedly, finding someone in the middle of an ocean is quite difficult. In fact, in deep sea, there's a one in six chance. A sea zone that contains or touches no land is only a one in three chance. Um, having your auxiliary cruisers does help the dice roll, but then if your enemy decides to try evading, that can make life difficult. So you're usually better off trying to set up intercepting squadrons within sight of land, or better yet, blockade enemy ports, because if you're blockading and someone tries to pass you, it's pretty much a given that you're going to sight them. So that's the way to bring people to battle. The only reason I thought it was worth doing that is because of the threat represented by that Spanish squadron. And it's partly to play the psychological game of putting them off, running the risk of going through that area, because they may well defeat my weak squadron, but the cat will be out of the bag. And it's also a speed bump of sorts that prevents them from getting to the US coast before I'm able to uh, muster a defence. So hopefully that would have been a good play in, in game terms. So that's the end of the search segment. Now, had any enemy squadrons been found or had any of them tried to force their way out of the blockade or done anything, of, or if I decided to assault the harbour, um, with a defending ship or a defending squadron, uh, as has already happened at Havana once or twice, um, we would move to the naval combat segment, which I demonstrated in the um, the first of my t uh, uh, no second of sorry of my videos about this game. Um, but as it happens, nobody is in contact, so that ends the U.S. players' naval combat phase. Now, I appreciate I've been talking quite a while and in some detail about this, so I'm not going to linger too long on the Spanish um, phase, but I'll just show you a few things that are pertinent to the Spanish that, that um, give them different problems to what the US has to worry about. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this early in the game, 
I've been compelled to mark off damage to a large number of the Spanish ships, and I've marked them in circles. What this represents is the very poor material state of much of the Spanish Navy at the start of this war. So unlike the US Navy, a lot of their ships were in really poor condition. They hadn't been maintained for ages, and it would have taken some considerable effort to get them into action. Let's take a look at the... Um, the Cadiz squadron as an example. Now, if you are wondering why the only three ships behind the Cadiz squadron marker were the Palayo, the Carlos V, and the uh, Alfonso the Thirteenth, it's because these were the only ones that started fairly fresh, or at least that the Spanish were able to get repaired to a sufficient degree. Um, a lot of their other ships, because of poor maintenance, were nowhere near ready to go. And so the Spanish have to spend time investing repair points in these ships if they want them to go anywhere. And actually, some of them are in such a bad state, those marked with a little star, they can't go anywhere unless they're repaired first. So looking at the Spanish options, this game turn they only get two repair points. And the decision they've made, because the only, the only port that houses significant warships is Cadiz, they're going to put the repair points into fixing the cruiser Aragon and readying her for sea. So they've got just enough repair points to get her almost ready. But she won't really... Uh, she won't be going anything, uh, sorry, anywhere this turn because a lone cruiser on her own is unlikely to achieve very much. So the Spanish will probably hold on and avoid sending her anywhere until they've had a chance to get more ships back in action. Now, as for loading and recoaling, the Spanish have no troops to transport this turn and their colliers are, are fairly... Um, uh, are fairly full, I think. Let's just have another quick look at the deployment. Um, the Cadiz squadron has no colliers with it. Um, the Cuba squadron is is fully cold, but is trapped in Havana. They've already made two abortive attempts to break out, and they've lost a handful of gunboats for their trouble. So the rest of them are just lying low now. Severa's Cape Verde squadron has burned some of its coal, but not enough to warrant recoaling at this stage, and their collier is full anyway. Now, there are some Spanish merchant ships that could potentially load. I'm going to zoom in again so you can see these clearly. This is the Spanish trying to rack up some victory points. The, the Collier San Augustin and the merchant ship Catalina are in neutral Jamaica. And so what that gives them the opportunity to do is to load up. So I am going to mark the San Augustin and the Catalina with a C. And I'll do that because these ships began the game empty. So the San Augustin is loaded up with coal. And the Catalina... Oh, wait, hang on, can she? No, I lie. The San Augustin can't load up with coal because Jamaica doesn't have available coal supplies. She's going to have to make the perilous trip to another Spanish outpost in order to do that. But she can load with cargo instead of coal. So I might change her mission brief to do that instead so they can earn some quick victory points. There are other Spanish merchant ships in Cuba, but you can never load um, supplies in Cuba. The job is to bring supplies into Cuba in this game if you're the Spanish. So they'll have to try and sneak out. Bit too late for those guys because the second North Atlantic squadron's already blockading them. So that's all the loading that the Spanish are going to do. And now it's their naval movement segment. So.
The US flying squadron in the Caymans is not searching. So the Spanish are going to risk sending these two merchant ships out. And it works out for them because they manage to dash into Cienfuegos before the US Navy slams the door shut in their faces. The merchant ship Villa Verde in Manzanilla is going to make a similar decision and is going to zoom off to Jamaica in the hopes of picking up some cargo to run back in again before the blockade cuts things off. Now, unfortunately, this merchant ship, the Fast Concepcion, is stuck in Santiago because a very powerful US force is sitting outside the harbour. And the gunboat Mercedes, the cruiser Mercedes, I should say, powerful though she is in a very limited way, is not going to sail out and take on such an, uh, an impressive agglomeration of power. This Spanish merchant ship, the Montserrat, is loaded with cargo and is able to sneak into Guantanamo. So she's managed to make it. And lastly, for our lone Spanish merchant ships, we have the Ciudad de Cadiz, which is actually heading to the um, Caribbean in the hopes of helping the uh, logistical effort. So she's going to enter the West Horse Latitudes for two movement points. And then she is going to go to the South Sargasso Basin. Now, if she'd wanted to, she could have made for the um, for the Windward Islands and Martinique. But I think what she's hoping to do is keep her options open and just get herself safely to the vicinity of Cuba and Hispaniola. So, uh, so that's where she's going. But what of the Spanish naval units? Most particularly... What is the Cadiz squadron going to do? The Spanish decide, partly because they want to buy themselves some time to think it through, and also because they want to slightly frustrate that squadron over there, they're just going to hover threateningly in mid-Atlantic. They're not going to steam very far. They're going to just hold a position there and see if they can provoke any other reaction from the US. It's a bit of a risky move. Um, and also it, it, um, it does give the US freedom of action for a turn. But it, it also means most significantly the Cadiz squadron will not burn coal, potentially making a mistake. The Spanish, of course, can afford to, uh, losses. Um, well, they can't really. They, they can't afford any major losses. The US can't really either, but they can take more losses than the Spanish can and still retain a decent fighting capacity. The Cape Third Squadron, for their part, is going to be a bit bolder, but they're going to keep their caution because they have, they're still down to half their coal. So what they're going to do is they're going to make for the port of San Juan at Puerto Rico. So that's one, two, and they enter port having burnt one coal point because they're a fast squadron. So there we go. I have knocked them down. They have a third of their original coal left, but they have made it to port. And that has put them in a position to be a fleet in being, albeit a small one. But they've given the US forces in the area something to worry about now. In future turns, the US is not going to have a completely free hand to go around block blockading Spanish ports. 
And so happy with that, the Spanish declare that their naval movement segment is over. They're not going to bother instituting any searches because the only ships they have that are close to US Navy units are either too weak to challenge them or are unarmed merchant ships. Um, oh yes, one last thing. They are going to um, send that merchant ship out of um, Matanzas in the hopes that it might be able to pick up some cargo and dash back. So you can see the... Um, the U.S. Navy has quite a frustrating task on, it hands, they, on its hands. They really need to bottle these ports up to turn off those Spanish supplies. And so lastly, we get the, uh, the naval combat segment. Again, there's going to be no combat. The Spanish aren't going to be challenging any U.S. naval units this turn. However, Cargo ships unload at the end of the naval combat segment if they're safely in port. So we have a total of three cargo ships that made it into Cuban ports this turn. And each one grants the Spanish one victory point. So previous turns had seen the US in the lead with one victory point for successfully sinking some Spanish gunboats. Their, their score has now degraded to minus two because of these successful Spanish blockade runs. But they may get a chance to um, do something about that fairly soon, especially once they start seizing Spanish territory. In the first part of the game, the Spanish have many opportunities for these quick, easy wins. And it's a good idea for them to take advantage of them before the... the overwhelming US power which appears later in the game really begins to make itself felt. And so with the end of the naval seg uh, sequence, because that really does bring us to the end of it, it would go to the land sequence. Now, as you can see, the land maps are empty because no, no uh, invasions have taken place. But had they done so, you'd have seen a scenario very much like the one I outlined in my um, previous video where ground troops would be placed, the invasion would go ahead, and you would follow the sequence of land combat steps. And you sometimes, especially late in the game, have a situation where naval activity is happening on this map and you can have up to two or three simultaneous campaigns being fought on the maps up here. So the game does get busier as time goes on. But for now, with no land sequence happening, that brings us to the end of the turn. And the turn marker would be advanced down the box to the next one. So there we go. That is the narrative of a campaign game turn. I'm sorry if it sounds like it's gone a bit slowly. I might have been pausing a bit too much to, to go on a bit about detail and to talk strategy. But I hope that's given you a good idea of what a campaign turn looks like in this game. Between experienced players who've played the game a lot, this um, the campaign game actually trots along at a pretty respectable pace. Um, I find the early turns are actually the longest because you have the most strategic options earlier in the game. Once both sides commit to, the, to their chosen strategy and show their hand, and yes, once they've suffered the occasional um, victory or def uh, sorry defeat or you know enjoyed the occasional victory, their play becomes much more obvious and they much more single-mindedly pursue their goal. You know, cough, cough, Havana, the game winner. Um, so, uh, but in terms of general impressions, I just hope that's been um, useful. So that is the structure which ties the tactical rules in to the larger game. Um, I realize I've gone on for a fair while, so I'm going to wrap this one up there. But as always, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate your company in this one. And I hope you've been enjoying this series on Remember the Main as much as I've enjoyed recording it. I will see you in my next video, which will be my final thoughts and impressions and a, a wrap up on this series. But in the meantime, 
Thank you very much again. I really appreciate you tuning in. Until next time, bye.